Okay. Hi, Dr. Hall, and thank you for joining the Western Canon Podcast. Hello. Pleased to be here. Thank you. Um, so why don't we start? You, you wrote a, a great book called Aristotle's Way. Um, how many years ago did you write that? That was uh, a couple years ago now? Uh, I finished it in early 2017. Yeah. It's an excellent book, and I've, I've been thirsty, hungry for um, a good book on Aristotle, and I've, I've come across a couple, but this is by far my favorite. It's very clear. Um, it's written in a kind of accessible, modern prose. Um, uh, Dr. Hall's book is Aristotle's Way, How Ancient Wisdom Can Change Your Life. And um, I wanted to start by asking you just a little bit about the man. Who was Aristotle? When did he live? What, how was he raised? How was he educated? Um, how did he live? What did he accomplish? Okay, so Aristotle lived in the fourth century before the Common Era, his whole life. He was born an uh, ordinary local town physician's son in a little town in northern Greece called Stagira, which was free and independent, but under constant threat from the expanding Macedonian Empire. Uh, unfortunately, his parents both seem to have died when he was about 12 or 13. But he was very fortunate, given that uh, tragedy, that his uh, brother-in-law took him in and realised very soon that he had a quite exceptional intellect and at 17 t sent him off, and he could afford to, that was the other good, good luck, to Plato's Academy in Athens. Right, which is the one and only great university in the world, pretty much then in existence. And Aristotle spent 20 whole years there as uh, Plato's favourite, most brilliant, but also most difficult student. Uh, and after that, unfortunately, when Plato died, the other members of the academy were all rather jealous of Aristotle because he was so brilliant and they didn't elect him head. So he then um, had a couple of years um, traveling and helping uh, people in um, uh, monarchs in Asia Minor and studying zoology on the island of Lesbos with his friend Theophrastus, who's the other great peripatetic philosophy. This philosophy is called peripatetic. Uh, then the invitation came from the great Philip of Macedon. They had to go and educate Alexander, the young Alexander who was going to be Alexander the Great. He spent about six or seven years doing that. And it's actually quite amazing he managed to stay alive because of what was going on in that court at that time. And there were daily assassinations. <laughs> uh, finally, once Philip was assassinated, Alexander crossed over to uh, India, as is portrayed in, 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 in the movie Alexander. Uh, Aristotle, at the age of 49, was finally free to do what he wanted. And he went straight back to Athens. He loved Athens. He loved the democratic city and its theatre and its intellectual culture. And he founded his own university called the Lyceum and for about 12 years ran it, uh, the most important uh, interdisciplinary multi-faculty university in the world with a massive research library, hundreds of graduate students and postdocs um, until he was then driven out because of political shenanigans and died at the age of only 62. But he had achieved the foundation of numerous disciplines, including the sciences of, of zoology. Um, you could argue the foundation of physics. You could argue, uh, well, you don't have to argue. He certainly founded formal logic, all the logical uh, syllogisms that we still use today, as well as all his famous works as a great philosopher. So in my mind, he's quite simply the most important intellectual who ever lived. And I'm perfectly happy to be regarded as Eurocentric or whatever because of his contribution to so many fields. And he's also, he lived a very good life personally. He's my personal role model. Uh, I wanted to ask you a follow-up question. You, you mentioned the term peripatean. Um, that is actually a word we use ta in talking about uh, Greek tragedy. Is there, what's the connection between sort of peripatia in terms of the fall and Greek tragedy? Oh, actually, and the none. <laughs> um, well, one, that is peripeteia, ah. which means it's to do with uh, a reversal or a falling out in a different direction. 
uh, the way that um, fate works out, reversal of fortune. Uh, peripatetics comes ah. from the ancient Greek, the ancient Greek, and actually it's still the Greek today. I go for a walk is peripateo, right? It, it's still the same word. And there are two different explanations, so they're allied. One is that he liked to walk while teaching. And they actually use the rhythm of the strides to do the question and answer and stride over the Greek landscape with his students. Uh, the other is that he actually built a thing called um, a peripatos, which is like a huge cloister at the Lyceum, as the monks did in the Middle Ages, so they could take their exercise uh, sheltered from the rain um, while still discussing intellectual matters. Of course, both those explanations could be completely true. Very cool. Thank you very much. A lot of people assume because I do the Western Canon podcast that I know ancient Greek. I do not know Greek. So thank you for that. That you know a woman who does. I do. I know a woman who does. <laughs> So you talk a lot about happiness, especially in the introduction to your book. And I, I really like that kind of meditation. Um, uh, it, this is central to Aristotle's philosophy. Uh, Aristotle would say, what is one thing that all men have in common? And it's that they want to be happy. And so I want to read a quote from, from your book. You say, quote, the words happy and happiness work hard. You can buy a happy meal or drink a cheap cocktail during happy hour. You can pop happy pills to improve your mood or post a happy emoji on social media. We value happiness highly. Singer Pharrell Williams' song, Happy, was number one and the best-selling song of 2014 in the United States. Yet we are confused about happiness. Almost everyone believes that they want to be happy, which usually means a lasting state of uh, psychological state of contentment. Paradoxically, in our everyday conversations, happiness far more often refers to the trivial and temporary glee of a meal, cocktail, email message. So these are some uh, passages from your book, and then you go on to talk about happiness as a kind of lasting, permanent state, and or even happiness as well-being. So none of these, um, none of these sort of contemporary, modern, um, sort of fleeting, transitory uh, happiness as pleasure. This wasn't really how Aristotle thought about happiness. Um, what are we getting wrong about happiness um, and our sort of fat, uh, American, wealthy, just happiness as a Big Mac, right? What, what, what was Aristotle's diff definition of happiness and how did it differ from sort of the modern notion of happiness? Yeah, it's a very, you know, it's a fundamental question when it comes to his moral philosophy, which is set out in his great book, The Nicomachean Ethics. Um, he starts with uh, the question, uh, what is it that humans aspire to? And happiness is clearly something that everybody, almost everybody say, they just want them to be happy, they want your children to be happy. But then he says, so what is this thing, happiness? And actually he rules out almost immediately uh, the um, what you get from uh, acquiring material possessions and physical pleasures. So fine meals, whatever. He says that if you don't have money, Poverty is a direct threat to uh, being able to be happy. So he's not one of these ascetic philosophers who thinks that the good life uh, in a physical and material way doesn't matter. But he thinks it matters because it makes you free to pursue higher pleasures of the mind and soul and society and your relationships. So then he goes on to try and sort out, well, then what are the things that make us happy? And he decides that it's got to be something active for the simple reason that you can't describe somebody who is asleep as happy, nor in his definition can you describe somebody who spends their whole life on a sofa watching Netflix and eating popcorn as happy. They might be physically pleasured or content, but you will not say that they led a happy life because he thinks that a happy life is an ongoing project, it lasts through time, and it requires personal fulfillment of your talents and abilities and scope. It's doing, doing, and it's an active verb. I see his happiness as a verb, not a noun. It's not a state um, that you acquire, it's what you repeatedly do and how you uh, go about actively achieving your life goals. Uh, that's that's the true state of happiness. And the glorious thing about this is nobody and nothing can actually take it away from you because it's self generated. He's very good on luck. He says bad luck is the great enemy of being able to do that. I mean, you, if you're 
end up in prison with a, a life sentence that you don't deserve, then of course it's going to be much harder. But even so, because it's generated inside you, you can still try to become the best possible version of yourself, even in confinement. So it's actually very optimistic. You can do it. Um, so in some ways, it really suits our 21st century mindset that it's up to us to make the best of our lives. But in terms of material consumption, it does not suit it at all. And yeah, and I think that that is still very resonant with us today because every year I, I teach philosophy and, and every year I go over Robert Notzik's uh, experience machine and it's really hard to find a student. A stu some, sometimes students are deliberately trying to be uh, edgy and rebellious and so they'll say, yo, yeah, I would plug into the experience machine. But usually 98% of students say, oh no, goodness gracious, that's not right. happiness. Um, and that sort of thing. Uh, eudaimonia. Am I saying that right? Eudaimonia. Yeah, eudaimonia. Yeah. Eudaimonia for Aristotle. Um, what What is that? When I'm teaching this to my students, I tell them that it means kind of what you already uh, said. It ha means kind of having a good indwelling spirit, being in a contented state of health, happiness, flourishing, well-being. And I try to emphasize what you said, that for yeah. Aristotle, happiness is not like a platform that you finally reach. It's not like a no. like an anesthetizing like bath that you are just uh, uh, floating in and then you're happy forever or something like that. It's something that accompanies certain activities. How do we achieve that? Like how do we start to approach um, achieving eudaimonia, living, um, uh, uh, one of the examples I use with my students is it's not, uh, it's not reaching courage, it's living courageously. Um, how, how, do we, um, how do we meet Aristotle's ideal in our own lives, do you think? Well, he, um, having set up this great question, what is happiness and how do we achieve it? He uh, advances the theory that it's actually um, repeatedly doing the right thing. Uh, it's a very pompous set of words in Greek, like justice and so on. But I see uh, the doing the right thing, trying to be uh, deliberate and take the right decision to do the best possible moral action, both for yourselves and or your codependents, because he always emphasizes that you can't be moral on your own, really. <laughs> right? yeah. it, it, it's something that happens in synergy with your loved ones, your neighbors, your fellow citizens. So it's a matter of repeatedly trying to act in accordance with um, the most virtuous form of behaviour. And again, it's easy to lose people with words like virtues. It sounds like very pious. It just means good qualities as opposed to bad qualities. So then he, in the Nicomachean Ethics, really very seriously goes through. He, he, he's perfectly happy to identify things like, say, courage, it's the one you chose, and say, well, what is it to do a, a, a courageous act? And here is the next reason why I find Aristotle so um, compatible with sort of modern sensibility and indeed post-Freudian sort of therapeutic models is that he doesn't believe emotion is bad. He doesn't believe passion is bad. He doesn't believe instincts are bad. He thinks we're just advanced animals and that emotions and instincts and drives like sex or eating are um, there to help us achieve our fullest self. They're not bad in themselves at all. And that is the biggest thing that distinguishes him from all the other ancient philosophical schools practically, uh, including Platonism, Stoicism and Epicureanism, all of which argue that passion and emotion and instinct needed to be controlled and mastered and battened down and replaced with reason. And that was adopted very much by Christianity. They took up Platonism because it really said body bad, spirit good, right? Mm -hmm. Now, there are all kinds of ramifications of that model, which would be rejected by anybody in post-Freudian therapy, mm -hmm. because we've got to uh, embrace our inner child, our emotions right. and instincts. And right. Yeah, exactly. And there are all kinds of ramifications of that that are heavily gendered. Mm -hmm. Because women have a female body has always been associated with the sort of animal uh, and the, the disgusting and the repellent in most of the major monotheisms. And if you take Aristotle seriously, then all those sort of animal aspects of us, provided we um, try to uh, modulate them with our power of reason, choose the right time to have sex with the right person to have sex right. with, then it's a good thing. 
So if you take courage, he says, this is this is the next revolutionary step. Instead of a binary system of, um, well, let's let's take a f love. Let's take love for a minute. We'll go on to courage that just passionate love, right, is is bad and self-control is good, which is what all the other ancient philosophers and Christians would tell you. If you take the model that actually it's a triple thing, it's a gradient and having no power of sexual self-expression is not going to make you a good moral agent, right? And you're not going to get happy. Having too much, which you use at the wrong time, is not going to make you a good moral agent and it will make you and others unhappy. Right. But having exactly the right amount at the right time in the middle, right, the mean, Aristotle's mean, is what we've all got to aim at. Now, I found this as when I discovered Aristotle as an undergraduate in my early 20s, as an extremely passionate person with very strong emotions um, and desires. And I'm very interested in food. I'm a good cook, right? Um, and love to make people happy with good food. But my Christian upbringing was telling me that was um, somehow coarse and bad and animal. So I found this utterly liberating that instead of rejecting all these inherent parts of myself, I simply had to find out the way to do them right and get them in the middle. And so I think for anybody struggling with, with a, trying to find a secular morality, you can't be doing with repressive religions um, and knows that, uh, you know, basically feel good about their body <laughs> and like being an advanced animal, then this is the philosophy for you. And courage is a very interesting one because he doesn't just say courage good, which any Stoic would have done. Cowardice bad. Right. He says, cowardice absolutely bad. You cannot be a proper moral agent. You will not stick up for people who need you to stick up for them. Mm -hmm. Too much courage, foolhardy, risk taking. You will put your own life at risk. You will therefore put the well-being of your dependents in danger. Right. Um, and you will make people unhappy. The right amount of courage in the right circumstances at the right time for the right moral right. reasons is right. what to aim at. So this is extremely liberating for vivid personalities yeah. <laughs> who um, uh, want to live an ethical life but can't imagine just repressing things. Right. So let me um, ask a follow up question here. I just uh, I just penned a review of Carl Truman's Rise and Triumph of the Modern Self at the American Conservative. And um, in Truman's book, he talks about you, you mentioned post Freudian therapeutic, uh, the sort of therapeutic model of the self, the idea that I get to create myself. The self is increasingly kind of sexualized. Um, does, let me let me push back a little bit and just ask you, because you're the expert here. When I think about Aristotle, I think of Aristotle as someone who is not just embracing the therapeutic man, right, to, to use Philip Reef's term. Um, I, I, I see Aristotle as someone who's saying there is a telos to things. There yeah. is a there is an actual telos uh, to the human being. Uh, the world is teleological. There is order and reason. There is there is an external world. Like Aristotle is no postmodern. He's not saying you can just get to be whoever you want to be. Um, is, is, is there a tension there? So you're saying that uh, uh, Aristotle would kind of embrace the therapeutic uh, man. But isn't there a sense in which we have to come to grips with reality to, in order to be virtuous? Isn't there a sense in which post-Freudian therapeutic, um, the therapeutic psyche would say that I can create meaning, I can create, uh, uh, morality is relative, I can create my own purpose. Aristotle's not saying you can create your own purpose, is he? Um, no, no. it's the identification of your telos, and you've actually really only got one. Okay. Right. Uh, with, there's a little bit of variety, uh, possibly, about the way you express it. Um, if your telos is that you, you know, your great gift, it's recognition of your great gift is is musical, then it might be that your absolutely perfect telos would be to be a world class and world famous violinist soloist. You might actually 
uh, end up being a very good member of an orchestra or a music teacher or indeed a parent who is just so good at, at, at playing their DVDs to their kids that they really help them learn music, right? It, it could take, it could manifest itself in different ways, which you have to accommodate to circumstance and fate and external forces. But you cannot alter the fact that the thing that you were born with, that you were going to be good at, was music. You cannot alter that. So he sees every little human uh, sort of fetus after the moment of conception. And he does recognise that there's bits of both parents in there somehow, though oddly, as you can imagine. But he does. That every little fetus, like every little acorn and every little egg um, and every little um, you know, two-cell blob of an amoeba <laughs> right. has got a perfect form that if it's nurtured properly and it's got to be properly fed or, or nourished or rained on or whatever, will achieve its maximal flourishing okay so every single one of us has got the big t loss to be an adult in our prime physically and intellectually mature version of ourselves which is just a beautiful homo sapiens in adulthood but further to that each one of us as an individual has got some kind of um, potential and the word for this is a dunamis Dyn our word dynamite, a potential which we, uh, if it's identified as his own was by that brother-in-law, that this boy was too smart in too many ways just to go straight and be a doctor, the physician, right? He needed to have his brain expanded. Mm -hmm. um, if we all had parents who would help us identify what we were actually good at rather than what our parents want us to be good at gotcha, gotcha. Um, then we could really maximize the achievement of the the true potential of everybody and i would like to see a world because at least half of the world never gets anywhere near its t loss because it's battling hunger right let alone education mm -hmm. so it is a, a you, the critique you can level at aristotle isn't, isn't um you know, that he's essentialist or non-essentialist, you can say that he doesn't take enough cognizance of how you do this in, in, in dire poverty. I mean, that you could absolutely argue that. Though even he does actually say that. He's quite aware that lots of people have to struggle to live. Mm -hmm. And you can't both struggle to live and have everybody flapping around being the best cook in the world, the best violinist in right. the world. But the ideal world would be one in which we all cared a great deal about everybody else's potential as well. And we were all trying to maximise the potential of every individual, which would then to him, because he then makes the great step into his politics, that individual flourishing can be multiplied in a city state and beyond the city state into collective flourishing. Right. But it's got to start from the individual up. Whereas Plato designed his ideal republic from the top down, like what will the guardians be right. like and how will they boss around the minions? Right. Aristotle starts with every single individual and then first the big partnership of their life, whatever that is, you know, it may be with a husband or wife, but or it may be a best friend, but wh whoever the, the primary re relationship of your life is. And then outward, gradually through next of kin, friends, it's, uh, neighbours, fellow citizens, fellow workers and all the rest of it. But you start with the individual. And again, that seems to me a much more 21st century way of thinking about how to build an ideal society than either a Benthamite utilitarian right. top down yeah. greatest happiness for the greatest number or a platonic guardians of the Republic uh, for everybody. Yeah, and this this is why, I, as a philosophy teacher, when I'm teaching my ethics unit to students, I usually do Aristotle after doing utilitarianism and Kant. Uh, and I like, to, uh, yeah, yeah, and I I like to start by telling students that you know, because after I've taught them modern theories of justice, right? Modern theories of justice are like utilitarianism. Um, let's see, uh, there's a utilitarian calculus, and there are higher pleasures and lower pleasures, and then like a lot of it comes down to with Kant. Kant, you just universalize your maxim is, you know, like, um, how do we know if stealing is wrong? Well, uh, you universalize stealing, uh, and if it results in a contradiction of conceivability, then, well, stealing is wrong. And it's like modern systems of justice 
separate questions of fairness and rights from, from yeah. arguments about honor and virtue. And Aristotle is saying that justice can't be neutral, right, among ends in this way. So debates about justice should be more about honor, virtue, that is virtu uh, virtue as character development, right? I, I would say his MasterCard with, with justice and legal morality which is society's attempt to create a Kantian code, after all, of what, what are the categorical imperatives about what you can and cannot do. Right. But he, he says what you always have to do, both judging yourself and, and how to act, and if you're a judge in court, is ask what is the intention, right? right? It is very, very, very possible that you may need to do bad acts in order to, and he recognizes that, you know, right. he's very, very sophisticated about means and ends. Right. For example, lying, he says, of course, lying is inherently, generally not a good thing to do. Right. And actually that's more because it's not conducive to happiness. It's not because there's a categorical transcendental right. worth right. to truth. Right. Right. It's because it's unlikely to make you happy. You, you won't, uh, you won't make good relationships if you, if you lie. You won't get a reputation for being trustworthy. People won't be able to rely on you. And also he likes this idea of you having a one, being very true to yourself. So you've only got one you, right. which you're the same to everybody, right. out of a consistent person. So he says, of course, in principle, we should always aim to be truth tellers. However, he actually, you know, this guy has lived in the Macedonian court trying to stay alive. And he gives an example, like if a tyrant has got a hold of your children, right? are you going to do a bad thing? Are you going to tell a lie to get them out? Well, of, of course, course you are. Whereas Kant says you know, the opposite, I'm, right? Kant says exactly. you, you have a duty to exactly. tell the truth. Because you must remember that your intention is to get innocent children free. Right. So you always go back, always, always, always to the intention. And equally, the judge who is then having to assess what to do with this person who's told a lie, and perhaps committed fraud, must, must ask what the intention is and frame the punishment accordingly. And that's why Aristotle would have hated the three strikes law. <laughs> he, you know, any kind of system where the judge is given no what he calls equity. He says there's a difference between equality and equity. A law based on quality means that everybody who does the same crime gets the same punishment, right? Regardless of whether they're stealing a loaf to feed their children right. or stealing right. drugs to, to, right. to, to uh, maintain a multi-million dollar drug empire right. cartel. Right. 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 Um, Aristotle says not at all. The judge has got to have the uh, flexibility to inquire into intentions. This is just all good sense to me. I mean, it, it, to me, Aristotle so often right. feels like theorized common sense, <laughs> you know. But funnily enough, I gave a, 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 an interview very like this quite recently to uh, uh, Islam, a very good is Islamic radio channel. Uh, where they discuss philosophy. I mean, it, it's not at all um, religiously confined, right? But this, the, the telling the truth was the sticking point for them. They, they, they felt they had, when I had given several examples of where I would definitely lie, right? Yep. They sort yep. of had to warn their audience. This is not what the Quran teaches. Wow. And it, but you can see, I mean, child psychologists can tell you exactly the age that children get to when they learn to lie. And they have to, or they will not survive in the world because there are bad guys in the world. Yeah. The point is yeah. getting the children to know when it is right to lie. And it is only right to lie if you're faced with a worse outcome for everybody, right. if you don't. If uh, your children is lying to you when you're actually the only one who really loves them, <laughs> you can't help them. So I've trained my children, I hope, that they never lie to me but they will absolutely lie if some guy tries to get them into their car. Right. Uh, they'll say, my mum is that lady on the corner. You know, I train them in what to say. Yeah. yeah. Um, so this is just a much more practice. It's both more sophisticated and harder <laughs> and more practical and efficient and sensible. Which is why I never Which understood why, why Kant just didn't... Um, 
didn't talk about prima facie versus categorical duties because you could easily just use Kant's system and say that if there's an overriding concern, right, in which one universal maxim would cancel out the other. So here's a good example. The person, you know, the famous philosophy example, the person comes to your door and says, I want to see your uh, sister because I want to kill your sister. Should you lie and tell the the murderer that your sister isn't home? Well, Kant says, no, your duty is to lie. Well, what you could say is, I never understood this. And I think modern Kantian theorists address this, but you could say, well, the problem with that is that if you universalize the maxim of murder, there can be no such thing as human people. Like uh, it's a contradiction of conceivability, which is why Kant is against murder. So, yeah. but here's the thing: if you universalize the maxim of "Am I allowed to murder?" and it results in a con- well, in a world in which murder is legal, there can be no such thing as lying either. Because if, if there's no such thing as people, there can be no such thing as lying. I just don't understand <laughs> why his system was was not more flexible to admit prima facie duties. Um, but uh, as, I'll tell uh, you why. I I I think the reason why Kant didn't manage those nuances, okay, is because he lived, I so I believe, um, all alone with no close family, uh, never got involved in public affairs, didn't run a business, didn't have to engage. He was just a brain in a vat. He's yes. just a, a brain in a vat. Whereas Aristotle had, from the age of thirteen, to sort of deal with the real world when he lost his parents, deal with being moved as an orphan into to somebody else's household, you know, deal with all the rivalries um, in Athens after Socrates, who was the teacher of Plato, had actually, uh, you know, deal with the contradictions of being philosophers in, in a world that was suspicious of philosophers, deal, he always was a resident alien in Athens, he had an extraordinary amount of, of business to take care of, to uh, run the Lyceum. Um, had many friends who were tradespeople and politicians. So he never, ever thought you could divorce these questions from real world examples, right? Mm -hmm. And he believed in engagement in the real world, which makes him very different from, say, the ancient Epicureans, who said that you had to aim at no hassle, ataraxia is what no hassle means, um, and, and, and divorce yourself. Actually, don't get married, don't have children, and don't run businesses. I find that when I'm talking to to business people, um, professional people, politicians, whatever, they all find Aristotle much more amenable to the real world dilemmas um, and catch 22s that they constantly find themselves in. Yeah, and there's a great quote. I don't know if you've read Jonathan Haidt's book, The Happiness yeah. Hypothesis. And I, I love Jonathan Haidt so much. Yeah. And um, he says this, he says, where the ancients saw virtue and character at work, in everything a person does. Our modern conception confines morality to a set of situations that arise for each person only a few times in any given week. While modern systems of morality focus far more on whether given actions are good or evil, ancient ethical systems worry less about rules for action and more about making people virtuous human beings, beings uh, capable of fulfilling their telos and utilizing reason and character to carry out complex- On their own, I mean, to do it for themselves. It's it's um, the charity Oxfam used to have a motto that uh, if you want to feed a man for a day, give him a bag of corn. If you want to feed him and his family in the village for a lifetime, give him a tractor. (laughs) And I see I I see like training in these ethics and and encouragement to apply them as, as giving people a tractor so they can go and plow their own moral furrows. You're not, you're not giving them a, 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 a set of shibboleths come down from on high. Right. And I really do believe that. Um, when people find it very hard at first, I mean, there's so many different examples, but I mean, how, how do you think every day about every decision? What is the best possible way to act? Well, the good news is that sooner or later, it starts to become more habitual. And Aristotle has this word for that, hexis. So that, of course, when you're first starting out, when it's like we have geared cars in Britain, learning to use the gear stick, you have to think every time do I go up into second gear? Every time should I be in third gear? Well, after six months, you never think about that. You just move the gear stick. Um, So I I see it very much like like that. My own example is is, is, it's in the book, but it's quite trivial. But it was very important to me. My parents were sort of, you know, 1950s, 60s parents, and they never smiled at me. 
So you go and just, if you went to go, try and get attention, you very often got a very sullen, why are you disturbing me? Children should be seen and not heard. Don't bother me. Go out and play. Look. And this did have an impact on me. And I was scared to, to ask for help. And that, and that was, has been a lifelong problem that, that affected my other relationship. So I swore when I had my first baby <laughs> to every time she came to me, put down what I was doing, give her my full attention and smile and say, how can I help you? Right. I don't harass her. if She doesn't want to talk to me. But if she comes to me and I've done that with both kids to the extent that it did become a bitch <laughs> and they both impersonate me because it's hello darling how are you <laughs> but it did become completely habitual and of course it was very hard work when they're small you want them to go away so you can watch tv you want them to go away so that you can have your gin and tonic in peace with your husband or <laughs> read the newspaper on a sunday morning it was a sacrifice you know it's hard work but i'm very glad i did it because i genuinely feel although they're young adults now that they will always come to me if they're in trouble uh, uh, because they're going to get a smile and, and a welcome and that even means like I always put the radio off if someone comes into the room you know, just I am hearing you you know unless I don't like them of course <laughs> well this is especially relevant with our phones uh today with our sort of isn't it it, it, it really put is put the phone down mum put the phone down so um, in your book, you say that nature, rather than a concept beyond nature, such as God or gods, is the fundamental basis of our analysis of our affairs and our decisions, going off of what we were just talking about. This is the single most important difference between Aristotle and his teacher Plato, who believed that humans needed to find answers to the problems of existence in an invisible world of intangible ideas or essential forms beyond the material world they could see. Um, so tell me a little bit uh, about the differences between Plato and Aristotle. There's this, um, there's this a great book, uh, The Cave and the Light, Plato versus Aristotle. It's by Arthur Herman. Um, and, and it's basically about, it's, it's called Plato versus Aristotle and the Struggle for the Soul of Western Civilization. And it's, it's all about how most of modern philosophy, as well as political ideas, can be traced back to kind of this twin uh, model, yeah. twin pillars of thought represented by Plato. And you can see this. You can see Plato becoming kind of Rousseau in a lot of ways. And you can see Aristotle going off in the other direction. And I think, by the way, you talk about how liberating Aristotle is. A lot of conservatives like Aristotle too, like a lot, because Aristotle says there's a telos to the world, that you do have to conform yourself to the world a little bit, right? Uh, Rousseau is all about the world is very oppressive and it's all about liberating your it's about how the world kind of hinders your authentic self-expression. It's all about, it's all about uh, uh, in a state of nature, men are good and liberating yourself from the oppressive society and all of this. And Aristotle says, you do have to adjust yourself to reality. There are certain facts that you have to conform to. Mm -hmm. And so I wanted you to just talk about these two different models of okay. thought and, and maybe ground that in Plato versus Aristotle. How, how are these models different and how have they kind of grown out in this complex way to, to represent completely different modes of thought? You could say romantic versus... Uh, uh, Scientific. Yeah. Well, it's, you've, you've put it there as two things. and It is two things. I mean, I'm, so I'm going to deal with what with just the difference between Plato and Aristotle first and then what that political implications might be for that second. So it, it's really quite simple. Uh, Plato inherited a, a religious metaphysics, right? Metaphysics means the world beyond what we can see in fosse, in the physical world, right? So it's things that aren't empirically discernible through our senses beyond the material world. And he inherited that. He changed it because he didn't like the idea of, of the Olympian gods of Homer who were quite immoral. OK, so he changed it to a very moral gods up there. But he was quite clear that our entire material, tangible experience, experiential world was just a poor, second rate imitation of an ideal, eternal, unchanging world where the sort of templates of everything, he called them the ideas or the forms, the templates of everything exist. Now, that's a very interesting idea, and it's, a and it's an attempt to deal with the fact that we as humans can think about abstractions, right? We can think about a concept like beauty, 
okay, we can do it. Our brains can create a world of ideas. That doesn't mean that that world of ideas actually is superior to the world we live in now. And it's also becomes bound up with ideas of mortality because he says the soul hasn't got a body and it goes off and communes with these ideas after death. Right. All of this adds up to a tendency to denigrate studies of the real world, studies of, of, of actual matter, which is hardcore sciences um, and studies morality of our little problems here in this life, because to Plato, there is nothing compared with the real morality out there in, in the eternal world. Aristotle simply said no. And, and, and a couple of times, he's not usually dismissive of Plato or funny. You know, he's, it's not how he writes. But a couple of times you can hear the impatience. It's just like, why are we putting this world nobody can see? And we don't even know exists ahead of the beauty and the wonder and the miraculous granular detail of our, our mortal lives. And he didn't really believe in life after death at all. So that's why he embraced things like biology, zoology, study of volcanoes, study of weather, uh, study of physics, study of everything, as well as the human animal who he treats quite biologically at first and then gradually says, well, ethics is part of the human telos. So my joking summary of that for my students <laughs> is this. I am very short sighted indeed. I have incredibly strong contact lenses in. I cannot see my own kitchen table, OK, if I don't put my contact lenses in or my glasses on. Right. So I have got a very clear set of forms of things in my hair, like tables and things I've created in the world. And I, I've often, I've, I would like to talk to a blind person about that. You know, what, what is their inside of their heads like? And I like to think that Plato was extremely short sighted. He came from a military family. He should really have gone off and uh, been a great general. Um, he did become a wrestler, but you could do that one short sighted, couldn't you? You could wrestle short sighted. Yes. Yes. <laughs> it's not like being a javelin thrower right. or something. Aristotle, however, we know had 20 20 vision. Okay, <sighs> bear with me on this. We know that because he is the first person ever in history to have recorded that he saw the moon pass in front of the planet Mars. Now, you can't see that in a world without telescope to that very good eyesight. And, and from that, he infers the moon is closer to us than Mars, which was entirely correct. He Brilliant. did that in 357 BCE, Brilliant. when he was probably had just gone out from the academy as a student and was sitting in the taverna with his mates and he saw it. Now, I think Aristotle had perfect eyesight. <laughs> And so he didn't need a world of forms because of the glory of the world that he saw about him. And actually, his visual descriptions of things are exceptional. You know, he, 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 he knew how to make you thrilled by a plant or an animal or, or a, a mountain or a star. Um, and so that is how I explain the difference. The reception as a, as a classical scholar would put that the way that's been received and has affected political theory later is very important i mean there is a direct route actually from aristotle to karl marx mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, yes there are conservatives who like aristotle for one Lots. reason Lots. but i know but there are also plenty of uh, people who are materialists in the modern yes. philosophical My sense. My favorite of the term, type of leftist. Who start always with what is the material basis right. of any human society. And it, whether or not you explain class struggle and revolution out of that, right. Right. it is the first question these days. We are all Marxists. We will all say, what does a particular city make its living from? What is the economy based on? Right. That's simply what Aristotle did always. And Karl Marx loved this from Aristotle. Aristotle made the other ancient materialists. And, and you have to make sure that people don't think materialism means wanting lots of possession. Right. It means right. saying matter is prior to ideas. Mm -hmm. Right. That's all it is. And that is through Democritus, the atomist and Marxism actually I think much more the way that our sociological, anthropological and economic models work 
unless we're religious, right? Unless we're or, or romantic idealists, mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. So Aristotle, Plato, I think, can only ever be really right wing. I'm afraid he utterly believes in the oligarchy of an elite few individuals. Yeah. So you cannot make the republic. I mean, there are people who've tried to look at it and say there are some communist ideas in it about property sharing, but you cannot turn an elite oligarchy into a democracy. There is nothing that can make it happen. Yeah. He hated the demos. Yeah. Whereas Aristotle, you then have to move into what he says about economics and human flourishing. And I believe a better case can be made for a moderate social democrat than from an arch capitalist. I believe that. Gotcha. I, I hear what you're saying, and I think that that's valid. And I understand what you're talking about with Plato. And I'm personally struggling to see Plato as anything other than that mapping Plato's Republic out and uh, applying it to a political philosophy. It would have to be some sort of um, right wing, um, it's something like that. But remember, too, Libertarianism is incredibly uh, influenced by um, Aristotle. Ayn Rand's yes. favorite philosopher, her hero, uh, was was Aristotle. Um, I guess I would say that it, it would depend what type of right wing you have. I would say European right wing, national. Okay. Your right wing is different than our right wing in a lot of ways. I know, I know, and we can get very great confusion in terms. But I would like to point, and Benjamin Weikers, you know, ten books every conservative must meet, read. I mean. I hear exactly what you're, you're saying, exactly. but if you go to what he actually says in the politics, and a short treatise actually called The Economics, uh, which isn't read that much, uh, because some people think it's by another peripatetic, but that, let, let that by. What he actually says, he does not believe in economic growth. He's absolutely clear that a city state needs to get to a certain size where it satisfies its basic needs through right. trade. Right but does not need them to expand the economy at all. He believes in, and, and, and green environmentalists are looking to this model of sustainability, that there is a surfeit of goods which creates more desire, which creates more trade, which is completely uh, inimical to the human flourishing in the society. The other thing he says is that poverty is the parent of revolution and crime. He says, you will never have a happy society where there is deep inequality. And remember that he has studied with his students 200 different Greek constitutions of city-states from extreme levelers to extreme tyrannies with extreme differences in, in, in wealth. He came to the conclusion uh, that if the differential between the property owned by one, the richest person in society and the property owned by the poorest was more than one to five, five to one, then you would have hatred and envy and nobody would be happy, well, that's and you best. would have revolution yeah. or crime or both. The one to five is so yep. strict. Yep. Of course, he's not a leveler. He says he doesn't want a society where everybody's paid exactly the same. You don't want right. complete seekers and parasites right. and right. selfish people right. who don't contribute. And also, you want to be able to reward talent and yep. merit if people yep. do something good. One to five is fine, I think. But that means if I'm paid £100,000 a year, which I can assure you I'm not, although some of my male equivalents are, but if I were paid £100,000 a year, if I pay my cleaning lady, who is not educated, less than 20000 she is going to hate me. Simple as that. She is going inevitably to feel envy and anger. So we cannot have a happy city state. And I think if we took that guideline when we're thinking about Bezos and, <laughs> you know, that the actually through covid apparently the richest five percent in the world have really cleaned up and are now it. even richer yeah. uh if we made them do the one to five wouldn't that be fun people who try to turn aristotle into a raving free marketeer wall street um money merchant and he also says that people who want to take money off their friends exploit their friends um that is not true friendship. You can't live in a society where all you want to do is rip other people off because people in society should be your friends. Okay, diluted if they're fellow citizens. It's not like your best friend, but you actually want their reciprocally want their well being. So you don't try and rip off your friends. So you don't invent products that nobody needs. Right. 
right. and that will do them harm. Right, right. <laughs> um, and and um, provide uh, disgusting lending services at, at 100 million percent. Well, that's that really is the best argument for inequality I've ever heard. I've, I've written, uh, I've published long pieces about inequality, and I think that really is Aristotle's argument for for inequality is the best one that I've heard. Um, because you know the economy is not a zero sum game, so me having yeah. more doesn't mean necessarily that you have less or someone that l less than me has less. Wealth is created, as Steven Pinker puts it. Um, uh, the creation of wealth involves shaping matter into improbable but useful configurations. Um, and of course, yeah. we make Jeff Bezos wealthy. We make J.K. Rowling wealthy because she provides a, a good or service that we want more than we want our money. So, but I hear that they call it now the spirit level theory, the spirit level theory yes. being the idea that too much inequality actually makes societies unstable. And um, I hear that. That's a very good argument. And that's actually, funny enough, the argument I persuaded my husband on, uh, both that Aristotle's worth listening to and also into a more leftist economic model. I mean, I'm something that Americans can't really handle it is that I'm a libertarian socialist <laughs> moral libertarian people should be allowed to, within appropriate ah, limits to you're do a civil a, libertarian yeah yeah civil. exactly but I would come down very hard with taxes on the rich if I gotcha. if I if I were queen for a day gotcha. um, but that's the argument my husband finally saw that he was going to be much happier in society where there was not anger in the streets Right. Yeah, Just to be able that. to walk down the village street and know that. that everybody would say hi and like him and wouldn't try and smash up his car because he had one. Right. Um, that that creates a level of happiness that no amount of, of multiple uh, income levels will ever uh, produce and a sense of safety. Uh, so these rich guys who have to go and build their gated communities right. to keep right. the dirty angry ones out, which I think is a very real um, possible scenario in the future if we carry on the way we are. We've seen rumblings of that with the last days of the Trump government. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. So I have one last question to to, to ask you, and I'll I'll just follow up what you said there. Thank you for being so sympathetic. I think you really hear me on all this. I do hear you on all of this, and um. I'll say this, I think that, so I'm a libertarian, I'm an American, I am like every stereotype you can possibly imagine, except that I'm a, a, a male high school English teacher, but I'm, 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 uh, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a gun, I'm gun friendly, uh, you know, yep. I'm a capitalist, I'm all those stereotypes, and actually I live in Massachusetts, so I'm surrounded by people who uh, think the opposite. Much more liberal than you are, yeah. Oh, goodness more... gracious, yes. Yeah. Um, but I will say that one of the things libertarians then have a hard time with is, so the, the argument that Robert Notzik made against John Rawls was, to, to your point, was, uh, Notzik said, Rawls, you can't be both an egalitarian liberal um, and believe in uh, natural rights. So, so Notzik's argument was the civil liberties that you, John Rawls, claim that you want to protect, like speech and privacy and the right to marry who you want to marry, those come from the same sources and same foundations in natural rights theory as the right to property, which is money. Um, and, and, and all of that springs from the sort of Lockean right to life. So you have a right to your life, and if you have a right to your life, you have a right to your body, and if you have a right to your body, you have a right to your labor, and if you have a right to your labor, you have a right to exercise your labor and keep the fruits of it. That's where property rights come from. And so Notzik's Notzik, argument was, you're saying that you want to keep all of these rights, like speech and, and all these great things that a true liberal cares about, but when it comes to property, suddenly you're like, oh, well, that doesn't matter anymore. So that was Notzik's argument uh, against Rawls. But Notzik never dealt with the fact of just the reality on the ground of how unstable societies can be when, uh, when the in Gini index rises too much, when inequality becomes too great. So I hear it's your argument. Everyone's liberty. I hear your argument. Mm. And it's a good one. It's everybody's. Mm -hmm. I hear that. Um, so let me ask you this, this, this one last thing, because this is something that I've never been fully clear about. And I think you do a good job in chapter, chapter three of your book, I think it is. It might be chapter two. Anyways, um, I've never been fully clear about this. It makes sense to me, and, and I try to explain this to my students and often have a hard time, to say that the telos of a knife is to cut, 
Um, if, if a knife doesn't cut, it is no good knife, right? Um, and of course, for, for Aristotle, justice involves, I could be wrong about this, but for Aristotle, justice involves things and the persons to whom things are assigned. Am I correct about that? So yeah. justice would involve its, its uh, what do you call that, just, just desserts um, theory, what, what do we deserve? Um, so you would say in Aristotle, in an orchestra, what is the purpose of a flute? The purpose is to, for the, that flute to be played well. Uh, what is the purpose of playing a flute? Uh, to produce excellent music. Who should receive the orchestra spots, right? The best players. Okay, but how does this, how does this shift on to, because I, my students get that when I tell them that, the idea of uh, things having a telos, and then your job is to fulfill that telos. But how do we figure out what our own individual telos is as human beings? It's easy when we're talking about uh, a knife. Obviously, you create a knife with an express purpose that it cut well. If it doesn't, it's no good knife. It might have an incidental telos, like you can you can uh, unscrew a flathead screwdriver with a with a with a butter knife or something like that. But how do we f how do we figure out what our telos is as individual human beings? That's another reason conservatives like um, Aristotle is because he says that we have an an inalienable we have an innate telos that's given to us, right? And actually, how do we how do we figure out once Aristotle tells us that we have a telos? How do we figure out what that telos is? How do we negotiate that, navigate that? Well, as I was saying earlier, I mean, I, I think Aristotle is very useful for parents. I think parents and people in parental positions uh, like teaching. You and I both teach. We have a huge responsibility to actually try and I, help young people identify where they should be going. I really do believe that. And I do actively try to do that and, and make actual suggestions <laughs> not just to my children but but to the people I teach they may or may not run wrong with them but the very fact you give them the attention but he actually gives a very simple answer at some length which is what makes you feel pleasure and happy is what you're going to be good at and he said nobody who is going to be good at maths is going to feel miserable doing mathematical calculations gotcha. on the other hand anybody who feels miserable doing mathematical calculations is never going to be happy if you make them be a mathematician so he actually says this is where actual the pleasure he doesn't think constitutes in itself permanent happiness but the thrill that a kid gets out of something will hold huge huge clues my own parenting style was therefore to expose my kids to as many different things as I could and watch, watch really hard. And, but really as many sporting, cultural, food, uh, friends, experiences. And you know what? Um, one of them became a historian because I used, she's studying history. She decided she loved history because she told me she got so excited just going to old castles and imagining, <laughs> imagining what was going on. And she actually told me that. And the other one, I had no idea because I'm, I'm a classicist. She suddenly told me that she was going to read Japanese at university. That's cool. OK, yeah. Um, I said, oh, gosh, when did you decide that? And she said, well, do you remember when you got me that cartoon called Nausicaa in the Valley of the Wind, which is one of these amazing yes, Japanese anime? I've seen it, yeah. When she was eight. The fact that I'd shown her every other kid's film from all around the world I could lay my hands on because I because I did, but it was that one. And I'm not saying, you know, maybe I've just been very lucky, but I've, I've asked them about it deliberately. Uh, and that was what, and, and, and fired her imagination. And, and it's true, I remember then, by the time she was 12, she was constantly asking for all those um, uh, Japanese type things. And she, ju she just loves it. And she's currently working from her, 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 her financial job, is <laughs> testing computer games. Uh, from with the Jap, you know Japanese input and and so on. I don't know what she'll end up doing, but she's happy. Mm -hmm. So if I'd said to my children, right, you're going to be a lawyer, right, and you're going to be a nuclear physicist, can you imagine the catastrophe, <laughs> right? And neither of them. I was sad. I was sad. I felt the parental sadness. I much enjoyed learning piano and violin as a, as a child, and and have, it's helped the fact that I can read music. Has been, I mean, I never did anything with it. It's been a great joy to me. And I was upset that they both had no interest whatsoever in classical music. But so what? 
they love their own music. You know, it, it wouldn't be nice of me to have imposed that on them. So I'm that's where reason comes in then. That's where reason comes in then, because you, right. you, you expose your children to all of these different opportunities, and you can see which ones they're good at and which ones they're not good at, and they have a special talent yeah. for certain things. And then you yeah. encourage and I them don't, to... I don't, mean in, I don't mean in a helicopter mother frog marching them round thing. I mean, just, you can do it through the DVD player. You know, you, you can just select a huge variety of stuff. Um, and uh, I think parents, it, the, the trouble is when if they've got a child who's interested in something way out of their realm of experience, that's tricky. Um, you know, if it would be unlikely I would ever take a child to an American football game. But perhaps I should. <laughs> <laughs> if you want. So uh, th I want to thank you for being on the program. And I, I wanted to just tell you one last thing. I wanted to tell you why I appreciate um, Aristotle so much. And, and one, lesson that I tell yeah, my, one, one lesson that I tell my students is in this age, especially in America, I, I really don't know how, um, how Britain is. I have a, a few friends in Britain and I went two summers ago, but um, we're extremely polarized here. Um, we are going through such a period of tension where one side hates the other side. We're, we're, we're dealing, we're having such a hard time talking to one another in this country right now. It's really bad. And I'm not, it's, it's, as, it's, I would say it's as bad right now as it's been since the late 1960s in America. We're just in a raging, raging culture war and we're not talking to one another. And what I tell my students is one of the things I love about Aristotle is I think he would want to change how we have conversations. When you turn on the news, you hear, um, you hear these talking heads shouting back and forth at one another about which tribe engaged in the worst behavior today. And I tell my students, I, I, I like to think Aristotle would want us to, to have a different level of conversation, bring it down to a deeper level, and ask this question to one another. What should the telos of America be? What should the telos of America be? What should be its purpose or function? Because a lot of the ways in which we disagree are... I think the telos of America should be freedom, should be negative natural, natural rights, the government protecting our natural rights. I think it should be freedom, for the most part, with some guardrails. And people on the other side think it should be equality, sometimes equality of opportunity, sometimes equality of outcome. But that's a conversation we can have. That's a, that's a conversation that could be productive, that could get us somewhere. We could compromise on that. Do you think that Aristotle would approach political conversations this way? Do you think he'd want us to ask, what is the purpose of our uh, of a nation? And what do you think is the purpose, uh, to, using that Aristotelian framework, what is the purpose mm -hmm. of a nation? Okay, it's uh, philia. That is his word for friendship. And that is that every single relationship within that city-state, and he was thinking of a community of about, say, 200,000, um, was a diluted form of the love you feel wholly um, altruistically for the one or two people you really love, right? So it's a much diluted version of that, but it is based on, on your priority is the welfare of everybody else, the well-being, and that is what he calls friendship. And at some point... I think they did have some of the founding fathers, you know, were very much Aristotelian. Uh, there is language of Jefferson about uh, pursuit of happiness and uh, deliberation, all that kind of thing. But at some point, the idea that the whole community was just an extension of a best friendship has got completely lost. And that's not just in America. Um, and there, there are historical reasons for that. One is that the ludicrous exclusion of people with some skin pigmentations from all those rights at, 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 the, at the beginning, people with certain uh, gender <laughs> from the beginning, um, the in, in, in the America um, well-remembered genocide. I'm sure there was genocide in the British Isles 2000 years ago, but it's, it's not remembered in the same way. And the... Uh, raging financial inequality and I, and I really really think America's key loss can until it fixes that you know until it, it, it stops people feeling that 
uh, because then they attach tri those tribal names to what is, I do believe, fundamentally economic. <laughs> I do I do believe that the, 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 the Trump fanatics feel as strongly as they do because they feel deprived. The other thing that Aristotle would focus on, beside that finan financial thing and in, in preventing people feeling friendly to each other, just simply friendly, like the, like the cleaning lady I was talking about. I mean, I, you know, is it is education. We have got into a position where instead of everybody craving education, as they certainly did in Britain in the 19th century, right, the working class absolutely craved it and wanted it for all kinds of reasons, including self-improvement financially, but also anti-boredom, enlightenment, you know, <laughs> all those kinds of things. We have lost that. And it is somehow or other the American plutocracy got identified with hyper education. And that's actually not altogether the case. Agreed. But th this is the and, and I find the raging against expertise and enlightenment more frightening than anything, because if people actually reject the idea that education is going to help us live in a happier society, then how do we even start? We can't even start at school level yeah. if they just say, if they just say, I mean, Bannon was very clever the way he used words like deconstruction and everything to, oh, yeah. to sort of take to take the mickey out of intellectuals. Yeah. Yeah. So if you develop a hatred of intellectuals alongside gross financial inequality, mm -hmm. you're stuffed. Yeah. I, I, I understand that. And I think what I suppose what a lot of, of people on the right would say here in America is that our elites aren't good elites. They are um I, I know sort of the uh, highfalutin, highbrow conservatives who support a nationalist, populist kind of post-Trumpian sort of politics, what they say is not that elites are bad, you're always going to need an elite, not that education is bad, but that our educational institutions in America are overrun with political correctness, with a kind of hyper-identity politics, with a kind of, a kind of weird left-wing racial essentialism, a kind of Well, weird... I partially agree with that. I would partially agree with that. And they're saying that, I'm, that I'm, very, I'm very worried. I mean, we're getting a long way from Aristotle, but no, I'm extremely worried about deplatforming and so yeah, on. Yeah. I, I, I'm a British freedom of speech. I, um, I, I understand your arguments, and I wish more. I wish more liberals would make arguments like you about class, yeah. primarily, because mm. I think that's a winning. I think that's a winning message, whether I like it or not. I think that's a winning message. Yeah. Um, but thank you for for talking with me about Aristotle and about philosophy and about politics. This was really great and I feel like I learned a lot. So thanks for being on the Western Canon Podcast. Great, thank you. Nice to talk to you. You too. Bye-bye. All right, bye-bye, thanks.